Bet you never thought you'd hear that song in church. <laughs> hey, good morning. It is Easter Sunday. Isn't it interesting what happens on a day like this? Isn't it interesting how if, if you're a person who usually goes to church or maybe sporadically goes to church, there's something about Easter where you make sure today you're in the building. Or, or maybe, maybe you're a person and you're like, I, I'm, not, I'm really not into church. And, and yet when your buddy asked you this weekend, hey, come, come on, go to church with me, you found yourself thinking, well, maybe. And then if one of your buddies finds out that you showed up to church and is kind of gigging you like, what are you doing going to church? It's, it's almost like this, this phrase comes out of your mouth. It goes something like this. Well, dude, it's Easter. All right. there, there's something about this weekend that makes us a little more open to or a little bit committed to being in a place where we're going to make much of Jesus. So on this weekend, we celebrate that Jesus is alive. We, we celebrate this crazy story. I mean, there's, there's almost no better word. Absolutely crazy story that this, this guy named Jesus, raised in Nazareth, he, he ends up in Jerusalem, and he's just driving the religious people nuts. I mean, they, they hate him because he questions everything they've taught. He questions their religiousness. He, cre- he questions their moralism. He questions all the systems. And they absolutely hate the guy so much that they plot his death. And on Friday, they get it pulled off. They get him brought before Pilate. Pilate goes ahead and gives in and says, fine, do what you want to do with him. And by nine o'clock Friday morning, Jesus is dying the most gruesome death almost ever, ever conceived that a person could die from by being crucified, where you literally suffocate to death, usually over days. But, but it wouldn't take that long for Jesus to die because they had literally beat him to death, a, a, a scourging that he probably would have died from within a matter of days or for sure with weeks. And on Friday at It looked really bad. His followers are taking his body off the cross. They put him in the tomb. But Sunday morning, Sunday morning, the the worst thing that could conceivably happen to these religious elite is that now Jesus' impact is spreading because the story of Jesus is alive is now just spreading like wildfire through Jerusalem. I mean, this crazy story, crazy story. So Jesus lives this really commendable life. Jesus dies a gruesome death that, that, that he didn't deserve. And, and then he's, he's alive after he's dead. That's what we celebrate today. But I got to ask the question, why the big deal about Jesus? I mean, let's, let's be honest. They now say what? About approaching 14 billion people have ever walked on planet Earth. About 14 billion people. And there's been some other great guys been some other great women. I mean, there have been some people who lived commendable lives. And also, there, there have been people who died gruesome, gruesome deaths that they did not deserve. Just watch the news. And then you, you hear them every once in a while, a story about somebody coming back to life. Like, here's, here's the, the documented evidence. I was in the hospital, or the doctor declared, and, and now I'm alive. We don't, we don't have days for them. What, what, what's the big deal about Jesus, anyhow. I mean, is it possible that going to church on Easter is really not all that different than shooting off fireworks on the 4th of July or opening your pool on Memorial Day or grilling out on Labor Day? Is it possible that going to church on Easter has just become a family-friendly American tradition? Well, I don't don't, don't think so, but but let, let me push on a little bit. Then if your buddy asked you, what's the big deal about Jesus, what would you tell him? What would you say? Why why Jesus and not not one of the other people that we would commend as having had a great life or a gruesome death or even a resurrection kind of resuscitation experience? Why Jesus? Well, the good news is we can answer that question. But to answer that question, we're... We're not going to look at the story of the resurrection. We're actually going to look at Jesus' teaching on life, which is actually the reason for the resurrection. 
So if you have your Bible, we're not just going to sit around and listen to me talk all day about stuff that I think. We're actually going to take a look at what Jesus said about life. So if you have a Bible or you have your phone or electronic device upon which you read books or the Bible, we're going to Matthew chapter 7. So open up your app, open up your Bible. We're going to Matthew. That's the first gospel. So the first book of the New Testament, chapter 7. Chapter 7. And as you jump to chapter 7, we're right toward the end of this teaching, the longest teaching we have from Jesus, uh, recorded from Jesus, called the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus has been sharing, and actually when we pick it up, he's just about to wrap it up. And he does so by telling three illustrations or stories. So here we go. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, no problem. We're going to throw the verses up on the screen anyway. So Matthew 7, verse 13. Here we go. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So Jesus has been teaching about life, and what's interesting is if you go back and read the Sermon on the Mount, you can tell that Jesus was not talking about religion. Lots of people talk about religion, what you should do or shouldn't do, and you know, all that kind of stuff. What Jesus was talking about was life. He keeps saying, hey, you've heard it said before, and he describes religion. But I say to you, and he's, he's describing life as something that happens from the inside out. Uh, just this, this life that you and I could never attain to. There's not a one of us in the room that could attain to this level of life that Jesus is talking about. And he keeps talking about something that's happening from within, a miracle that God must do. So at the end of it, he's going to give us three illustrations of how this really plays out. The first illustration is about a gate, actually two gates and two corresponding paths. So he invites us, and he says, enter the narrow gate and follow along the narrow path. And in doing so, he, he creates this, kind of this comparison. Here's, here's what life is like. As you go through life, you have a choice between a narrow gate, and the narrow gate is, is hard. You'll find life, but not very many people go there. And then, on the other hand, you have this, you have this wide path. And it's easy. I mean, it's just like kind of smoothed out before you. You don't have to worry about just kind of, you, you go there and you don't even realize you're going there. I mean, it's just the easy way of life. That's where most people end up. But it leads to destruction. It's, it's one of those deals that you kind of look up and you're like, where did my life go? It's not going to a good place. It's, it's that kind of realization. And yet Jesus is talking about more than just these 70 years or however many years the Lord gives you. He's talking about a life that extends into eternity. I mean, he's talking about life that has eternal implications. He's talking about that sense in you and that sense in me that there's more to this life than this life. I mean, there's something in you, there's something in me that we know we're more than animals, and we know that life is more than chance, and, and we may try to deny it. We may try to say, well, I don't know if I believe in the afterlife, but in general, you and I have a sense that there is something bigger than us. And Jesus is talking about that something that extends into eternity. And what he's saying is, most people go down the wide and easy path that leads to destruction. He's talking about hell. And the moment Jesus goes there, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I mean, if you ask people today, like, what do you believe about hell? What do you think about the afterlife? What do you think about eternal judgment? Most of our friends, our neighbors, our classmates will say something like, well... I don't know. I don't know if I believe in hell. I mean, who knows? I mean, I, I, I kind of think just like when life's over, life's over. I mean, my dog died, I, I'll die. You know, it's just I don't know if there's anything afterward. But Jesus goes there. And Jesus warns us about it. And though we may say, I, I don't know, Jesus is bringing this to our attention and saying, well, that's what most people think. That's the, that's the philosophy of the easy path. Most people are just going down the path of life and they're not even paying attention. Like they look up every 10 years and go, wow, how did I get here? And then they just keep going again. 
If you find yourself in the crowd of the majority, if you find yourself thinking like all the other people are thinking, if you find yourself saying to your parents, well, mom, everybody else is doing it, you're not on the right path. Because wide is that gate, wide is that path, and many people are on it. The problem is, it's headed for destruction. Now, let, let me see if I can take another shot at it. You know, when, when you, you, you hear Jesus tell a story about a path, and you start thinking, okay, now, when people first heard Jesus teach this, I mean, what did their paths look like? Or what was the topography? What was the terrain? What did it look like? And we kind of have a disconnect. Like, what's Israel look like? Well, let's just make it easy for us from Southern Illinois. It, one of the blessings of living in Southern Illinois is, is our great park system. I mean, we are blessed. We have some great places to go, especially this time of year. I mean, you can go over to Garden of the Gods, go over to Giant City, and, and a family favorite of our family would be Fern Cliff. I mean, it's nearby, and you have the waterfall. So let, let's talk about wide and narrow. So when the Nave family goes to Fern Cliff, we want to go to the waterfall first, and we have time, we go on other trails. Now, the first part of going to the waterfall is easy. So it doesn't matter if you're, you're using a walker. It doesn't matter if you're using a stroller. It doesn't matter if you're using a wagon. It doesn't matter if you're using a wheelchair. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. The, the first part of the journey to the waterfall is relatively easy. I mean, it's smooth. I mean, again, state of Illinois provided rock and that real fine rock, and it's just a great walk. And then you get back to the waterfall. So everybody can get to the waterfall. But when you get to the waterfall, for my family specifically, with a bunch of adventurous boys, that's when the real journey begins. Because there's a way up the waterfall. All right, kids, don't tell your mom that I told you where the path is. But anyway, you can go up the waterfall and then over around to the right, there's like this crack, this crevice. I mean, and you can climb up that thing. It is death-defying well, if you're four years old. Anyway, it's, 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 it's fun. It's fun. You know, it's, it's, you climb up that. And so what's interesting about thinking about, oh, go to Fern Cliff, go to the waterfall. The interesting truth for, for you adventure seekers is the narrow path is the fun path. Like, I want to do something that's, that's dangerous and scary. I want to go fast. I want to. So, Jesus, I don't understand. Like, why do you say most people choose the easy path? I wouldn't choose the easy path. I'd choose the, the scary path, the adventurous path. I don't, I don't get it. Well, here's the difference. Going to the state park, that's like a four-hour trip that you've set aside like, hey, I want to do something fun. Life is not like that. Life is just this long journey. And you know how it is. Life has baggage. Life has strollers, life has diaper bags, life has these, these old weights that we're carrying with us, and life has this thing of kind of lulliness into an attitude of, I'm just going for the easy path, because I've got all of this junk with me. That's the wide path. That's the easy path, and that's the path that most are going down. And then Jesus just pop right there in verse 14 did you catch it the first time narrow path hard way that leads to life and what did jesus say jesus said i'm inviting you to walk down the narrow path i'm inviting you to experience life remember that was what the whole sermon's about but not many people are going to come with me most people will miss it but today we recognize you don't need to miss it. We don't need to miss it. And yet Jesus was comfortable. Jesus was burdened with the truth of saying, most people choose the easy way that leads to hell. But I'm inviting you to choose life. I'm inviting you to step out of the crowd and follow me. Now, he doesn't stop there. Remember, I told you he's going to tell three stories. Three stories. Here's number two, verse 15. Beware of false prophets. Well, that's kind of an interesting shift. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. All right, so Jesus said, hey, what, take, like, look up. Look up, which path are you on? You going down the path everybody else is going on? Doesn't end up in a good place. 
Or are you going where very few are going in discovering life in me? Where are you going? Now, now let's talk about false prophets. So false teachers, people who are leading others in error. Jesus said, here's how, here's how it works. You look up in life and you're like, oh, look, it's a little cute lamb. Oh, he's so woolly and he's so cute. He's so, whoa. And you get up close and you're like, my, what large teeth you have. <laughs> it's a little Red Riding Hood kind of scene. It's like, haven't you encountered people like that? I mean, you, you look at them from a distance, you're like, wow, man, that's a really spiritual person. I mean, my goodness, what a beautiful life they had. I wish I could pray like that. And then you get to know them. You're like, dude, that's, you're a fake. I mean, there are some of you that struggle to be in this building because of hypocrites. There are some of you that struggle to even say, I'm trusting Jesus because you've encountered other people who say they're trusting Jesus and their life shows something very different. False prophets make it really hard. And Jesus says in verse 19, the fire's coming. The fire's coming. Now, when we encounter false prophets, we are to judge them. Not be judgmental, but to discern them by their fruit. So the Bible will describe the fruit that we're looking for as the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. There are nine that make up the fruit of the Spirit. That's what you're looking for. So as impressive as the exterior may have been, when you get up close, you're looking for fruit. Now, the the people who were the false teachers in Jesus' day, he already mentioned them in chapter 5, were the Pharisees. And he said, here's what the Pharisees do. They love to load you up with rules. They love to tell you what you can do and you can't do and you got to be qualified and if you're going to, you got to follow us and do it like us because they're absolutely convinced that it's the ethicalness, it's the morality, it's the legal actions of their lives that's going to qualify them to be in heaven. So they think that one of these days they're going to stand before God and God's going to say, wow, you're awesome. Please come into heaven. You'll make it so much better now that you're here. They're actually convinced of that. And so they're loading up everybody else with all of these rules. But Jesus said, just look closely. They do not have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. They have religion. Religion. Stay away. Stay away. Now, Now today, our false teachers aren't just, and I would argue not even primarily, legalist. You don't have people... You have a few. You don't have a lot of people running around America saying, hey, you got to keep these commands. And it, it, it's some, but let me tell you what the false teaching is today. Primarily, the false teaching of America is make your own way. Make your own way. Whatever's right for you, man, just do that with all of your heart. And don't let anybody tell you any different. Pastor Mark and I love leadership books. We just really enjoy reading leadership books. And when we were studying this week, Pastor Mark said, hey, Michael, have you noticed, like in a lot of the leadership books out there, that they'll talk about tapping into this power? And they will literally say, you know, hey, uh, you know, whether it's God or the universe or whatever you call it, tap into your power. Like, what is that? Isn't it interesting what that does? That allows me to make life about me. I'm going to get the power, may the force be with me, or you know, whatever you want to call it, but I'm not accountable to anybody because it can be the universe or God or whatever I want to call it. I mean, here's how people talk. They'll say, well, you know, I'm into Eastern mysticism. Uh, you know, she's into uh, Buddhism. He's a Muslim, and over here, they're Mormons, and this other group, I don't even know what they are, but they seem to be really committed to what they believe. So I think it's fine. I mean, the, the false teaching of our day is pick your way. Pick your way. And what's interesting is that most of the folks out there that are saying pick your way will also say, hey, Jesus can be a way if you want him to be. But that is the most illogical conclusion you can come up with. You can't put Jesus in that crowd. 
Jesus on multiple occasions said, I am the only way. Here's John 14, 6, where they captured his words. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes into the Father but by me. You see, it's, it's illogical to say, well, Jesus was a pretty good person, and you know, he like healed people and helped people and stood up for rights. And I mean, he was just a wonderful man. He makes me feel good about myself. And he's just kind of one of the choices out there. If, if you like the Jesus thing, that's great. If you want to do one of these others, that's also fine. That makes no sense. None. That is an illogical conclusion. You cannot put Jesus in the crowd. He did not allow us to put him in the crowd. He said, I am it. Either he was lying or he was crazy or he's actually who he said he was. And I love the way C.S. Lewis wraps it up. Jesus is either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's the Lord. Those are our only choices. Option number one, he was a liar, which means he was a deceitful prophet from hell. He was claiming to be speaking from God, but he was not speaking from God. He was claiming to be God, but he was not God. And don't you dare say that this false prophet was a decent guy. Because if he was lying, he is a deceiver and deserved to be stoned. Second choice. Well, I mean, he, he said all that, but he actually believed it. He was just nuts. I mean, he was one of those Looney Tune guys that just, you know, ah, you know, and he got himself killed. I mean, don't you feel sorry for the guy? He actually thought he was God and, and tells all these people how he's going to die and why he's going to die and he's going to be like the payment of our sins. And, and he ends up getting himself murdered because he was just so stupid to believe he was. Or, or he was the Lord. He was the one he said he was. He, he was the one sent by God. God's provision for our sins, his his only son, the only one who would be qualified to die in our place because he came and lived perfectly. No one else has ever pulled that off. No one has ever lived perfectly. And yet Jesus pulled it off all the way to the end. And at the end, he gave his life for us as a ransom, as a payment, as a sacrifice that God recognized Jesus' payment for our sins as final. And in that process, he told his disciple, hey, hey, here's what's, here's what's going to happen. Here are the people who are going to seek my death. Here's how they're going to kill me. And here's the day I'm going to come back to life. And he pulled it off. He pulled it off. And then his disciples consistently gave their lives for what they knew to be true. What did they know to be true? That Jesus was alive, even though he had died. He's the Lord. Those are your only choices you can't just put Jesus in the box of, of many. You just can't put him out there, oh, yeah, Jesus, or whatever, you know, it doesn't matter. Kind of, you know. He doesn't allow us to put him in that box. He said, I'm it. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. Well, here Jesus says, let me, let me tell one more story. And, and this may be the most helpful of the three stories we've looked at this morning. I'm about to read what I'm convinced are the two scariest verses in the Bible. Unparalleled, scariest two verses in the Bible, and you're about to find out why. All right, verse 21. We're going to skip 22 and read 23, and then come back to 22. So here we go. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's freaky. I mean, we can talk about, you know, uh, more people go to hell than go to heaven. We can talk about these false prophets and, you know, what's coming them and how dangerous it is if we follow them. But this is freaky. I mean, here we have people who are saying, Lord, Lord. Here we have people who are absolutely convinced they're going to heaven. And Jesus says to them, I, uh, I don't know you, never did, leave. When we were studying this week, Pastor Nathan said, this verse used to freak me out as a kid. As a young man, because I thought, man, oh, what if I didn't say Lord, Lord, right? I mean, as 
As an early believer, I prayed a prayer. I declared Jesus is Lord. I asked him to be my savior. And now there's this possibility that at the end of my life, I'll, I'll be in front of Jesus and he'll say, nope, you didn't say it right. Nope, you're not qualified. Ah, I never did accept that one. What do you, what? Now look at verse 22. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do mighty works in your name? Holy smokes, it gets even more confusing. I mean, they're saying, Lord, Lord, like, Jesus, you're Lord. And they did some crazy awesome stuff. I doubt there are very many of us in the room who have actually been a part of an exorcism, like a legitimate casting out of a demon in somebody else's life. The number would be small in this room, and yet they've been a part of that. They'd prophesied. What's prophecy? That's when you receive a word from God that is to be delivered to another, and it's really from God. They had done that. And then it says they've done mighty works. Like at the end of their lives, they were able to look back and say, wow, that was awesome. We did that in the name of Jesus. And so we read verse 22, we're like, holy smokes, not only did they say he was Lord, I mean, they have like quite a spiritual resume. And yet Jesus says in verse 23, leave, get away from me, I never knew you, out. All you have to do is look at the first five words of verse 22, and it completely gives away what's going on. Lord, Lord, did we not? Guess what this is a picture of? Do you, do you see what's happening? This is a picture of someone, a group of people, who are standing before Jesus. And when they're brought up in front of the Lord... What comes out of their mouth is, Lord, Lord, did we not? Hey, Lord, did you watch me down there? I was pretty good, wasn't I? Man, did you see that one day? <laughs> I bet you are glad to have me here. Do, do, do you hear what they're saying? Lord, Lord, did we not? Man, aren't you impressed with me? Didn't you notice all the great things I did in your name? Wasn't, wasn't that, wasn't I? All? That's the deal right there. If you are intending to one day stand before our Lord and tell him all of the things that you did that were so impressive that he ought to enter you into heaven, you are in for a rude awakening, a disastrous awakening. Because for the person who says, Lord, Lord, did we not? Their hope, their faith is not in Jesus at all. It's in themselves. I've been a good person. I've done good things. I deserve to go to heaven. And there's going to be a whole bunch of those people who look at Jesus and say, Lord, Lord, did I not? That are going to hear those disastrous words of depart. Depart. As Jesus tells these three stories, metaphors, he's also telling us about hell. Just, just a little piece at a time. In, in the first part, he said, hey, wide is the path that leads to destruction. Hell is a place of eternal destruction. In the second part, in those false teachers, he says, hey, the fire's coming. Hell is a place of God's wrath. Sin will be purged. Sin will be cleansed. It will be disastrous for those in that place of hell because of the fire. And then finally, he describes hell as banishment. Depart from me. It will be utter separation from the grace of God's presence. And we could spend 10 minutes kind of going through the different Bible verses. There are others. We could talk about the worms that don't die. We could talk about weeping and gnashing of teeth. I mean, we, we, could, we could talk about all the Bible verses that talk or describe of hell, but I can think of nothing more impacting or meaningful than to think of the hell, literally, that Jesus faced for you and me. Tuesday night, the Nave family sat down with just our three oldest, of course, to watch The Passion of the Christ. Man, that movie's 15 years old. 
and still gut-wrenching. There is no better way that I can think of if you find yourself in a place of, ah, Jesus died for sins, whatever, and watch the passion. Go buy it, go rent it, ask for mine. I'll, I'll let you watch it. It is amazing the hell Jesus faced for us. Amazing. As you watch the scenes of Jesus carrying his cross, and you see oh, the flesh that has been ripped from him, and you see he's just all beat up and bloody. I mean, he's, he's faced this horrific scourging even before he begins to carry the cross. And you watch him struggle and need help, and you watch him being spat upon. It's like, Jesus, why? I mean, really? And you see this, this destruction of his life. And you see that, that impact of being betrayed by one of his best friends. And this merciless trial that was fraudulent. I mean, it was just, just horrible. And, and at every moment, he could have said, I'm out. At any moment, he could have called upon the legion of angels. He could have just said, I'm done being here. And yet he stayed. And they got to Golgotha. And then they go to crucify him. And he willingly stretched out his arms and allowed them to drive those spikes through his hand. You're like, Jesus, thank you. And you watch this, this, this entire movie, and at the end of it, you're just like, oh. And one, one piece that, 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 that even the best Hollywood movie can never capture is what's going on spiritually. Physically, we can begin to understand of the horror that he is living through, the horror of his life being taken from him. But we can't even begin to imagine what it felt like to have the wrath of God, the fiery wrath of God being poured out upon him as Jesus became sin for us. Here was the deal. Jesus came, born of a virgin, lived a perfect life so that he would be qualified to die in our place, that he would be qualified to be the sacrificial payment for your life, for my life. And because of that, God poured out the wrath that was due us for our sin on his son, just poured it out. And because of that, there was separation, relationally, between the father and the son. Never before had Jesus experienced that. And now all that he's receiving from God's presence is just wrath, wrath, wrath. Jesus is the only one. This is not about us as Christians being snotty and saying, oh yeah, we've we've got the only way and you guys, the rest of you are less religious or less whatever. This is about us saying nobody else could do it but Jesus. Nobody else. No one else has ever come and lived perfectly. No one else has ever come and lived perfectly and then died sacrificially. No one else has ever come and done that and then predict his resurrection and pull it off. Nobody's done that. Our hope, our salvation, our joy is in Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And that's why Easter is a whole lot more than shooting fireworks on the 4th of July or opening your swimming pool on Memorial Day or grilling out on Labor Day. This is everything about life to us. It's Easter Sunday. Jesus is alive. Let me pray for us. Let me pray for us. Oh God, we are truly thankful for this day. On some days, we have found ourselves going down the wrong path. And yet today, life just truly comes into focus. God, I thank you that this is not about us because all of us in the room know that, wow, if it were up to us, we would screw it up. And Lord Jesus, we are exceedingly grateful for what you were willing to do for us. We thank you that you did not come to start some moralistic movement. You did not come to start some dynasty that would 
you know, get you a bunch of money or praise uh, in, in a quick fashion. But you came to give your life for us. And on this day, on this day, on this special weekend, we sense the goodness of our God. We sense the mercy of our God. And as we see images of a crucifixion scene, we even see the holy wrath of our God. And we are exceedingly grateful that that wrath was pointed at Jesus. We are unworthy. And yet because of Jesus, you've declared that we are worthy. May you receive our worship. May you receive our praise as we gather in the name of Jesus. May we sense that to which you are calling us. May we breathe life as we, as we accept and as we share the life offered to us through Jesus. May you receive our worship in this final part of our service as we sing and pray and confess. Lord, may you receive the glory as we make much of Jesus. Lord, this is that day, and we willingly make much of him this day. Do you be the glory. We ask this and we celebrate this truth in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, we have, we've saved uh, the best part for last. This is our opportunity as people to respond to the good news of Jesus. And so you now have opportunity to respond. So let me, let me talk about how you can respond. You will see at both ends of the stage, a, a serving station for communion. Uh, may, maybe you called it Lord's Supper. Maybe you've called it Eucharist in the past. This is an opportunity for you to come and declare that Jesus is enough. That your hope, your faith is in him, not in you. And what you'll see is a little serving cup and you'll peel back one layer and there'll be a little piece of bread. You'll peel back another layer of foil and there will be juice. And in eating of that bread and drinking of that cup, Jesus invites us to declare that his body was offered. His life was given for our lives. His blood was shed for the purification of our sins. And when you eat of that bread, when you drink of that cup, you're saying, my hope is in Jesus. My hope is in Jesus. Also, you'll see steps kind of all out here to the side, and you'll see people coming there to gather to pray. So they'll, you, they'll just come up. Sometimes they'll bring a friend, and they'll just begin to pray and meet with the Lord. When you go there, we know you want to be left alone. We're just going to let you spend some time with the Lord. You'll also see right here in front of the stage I'm standing on, you'll see a prayer team gathering, just some folks that love Jesus, and they want to be a blessing to you. And so if you came in today and you're like, oh, I need prayer. These are your people. They want to pray for you. If today you're saying, I, I need prayer because I've been on the wrong path. I've been, I've been going down the, the easy path. I've, I've, I, I allowed some hypocrites, some false teachers to, to cause me just to give up on Jesus. And man, I, I don't even know what hope I had at the end of it. But today, something is stirring in me. I, Michael, I don't even know what you're doing or what's happening in this building, but something is stirring in me where I actually believe this stuff. I, I didn't come today wanting to believe this stuff. I didn't come today expecting to believe this stuff, but something is stirring in me. Something is happening in me, and I'm ready to do something. Michael, what, what, am, I, what, what am I doing? God is bringing you to life. And he has prepared you to believe and to accept this gift of life for you. If you're ready to pray that, you're ready to declare that, you're ready to follow on that narrow path that is often hard, but leads to life, today is your day. The same prayer team would love to talk to you about accepting Christ as your Savior, what that means and where we begin. Don't leave this building until you answer that question. Why do I care? Why do I care? that Jesus is alive. Please stand, and we are going to give you an opportunity to sing, and as God nudges you to come and pray and take communion, to declare that Jesus is Lord as we gather in his name.